I taught in the Department of Child Development and my name was Marie Macy. And some of the young ladies that I know now who have children and grandchildren all call me Miss Marie to this day. Well, I started in 1955 and I was there for 18 years. My education at CSU has always been good to me. It's always afforded me jobs and opportunities because of my education. But uh, my first job after graduating in, uh, from a and in 1955 was with the preschool. And the director came to me and asked me if I'd like to be the assistant director, which was a dream job for me. And she was only there two more years and then left for another professorship in California. So the dean came to me and asked me if I'd like to be the director of the preschool. I loved every minute of it. What were some of the things that you loved about it? The children and their parents. I liked the parents too. They were all young. They were all my age. And, um, but the children, they were, you could just watch their little wheels turning up here and learning and doing and, and they all had something good for breakfast because they had a lot of energy and a lot of pep and, and uh, never slowed down. And I remember every child by name, I could name them all, and some of them I could, I still see today. And of course they call me Miss Marie, but um, one of them became a heart surgeon one of them an MD, a uh, couple of three are nurses. One little girl, when we did finger painting, w was just absolutely unbelievable. She could take her fist and do something with finger painting and it would come out to be a swan and you could recognize it. It was fantastic. And other children, you know, they just finger painted and did, made a big fat mess and loved it. And, uh, but hers were things, and she is now a recognized artist in California. Uh, one little boy fell off the teeter-totter when his partner jumped off and left him up here, and he fell down, and he bit his tongue almost completely through. So there was a lot of blood involved, and we wheeled him to the hospital and called the parents, and. Another little girl leaned forward to blow out her birthday candles and part of her hair caught on fire. <laughs> and we got that solved real quickly. Called the parents, of course. Had a little girl um, whose parents were from Switzerland. And we might go for a walk or something and we'd walk west. If we walked west, we'd go by that village, which would be west of Rockwell Hall and the faculty apartments, which are no longer there. And she always called it Wet Village, and we loved it. She was darling, and she's a very brilliant girl now with a PhD, and her sister the same. Uh, her brother's an MD. Um, we had a lot of fun experiences over there. One time, one of the students from CD whom we called teachers, so the children would recognize them as teachers, came in and she said, Murray, you're gonna have to come out here and help me. This little girl is getting so irritated with me and I just can't understand her. And so I went out to the sandbox and the little girl said, Hannah Mahoos, Hannah Mahoos. And I said, she has sand in her shoes because I could understand her. <laughs> and a lot of little children, when they came in at two and a half years old, we had them two and a half to five years old, um, didn't talk real well, or they baby talked, and we'd say, no, we don't baby talk at preschool. You know, you, you talk like we do today. And they would, because they could. And they were allowed baby talk at home, I guess. And 
Well, we just had all kinds of fun. We had a beautiful, beautiful yard with great big shade trees and a lot of nice equipment. And a darling little building, which is no longer. It was the first building west of Ammons Hall, which is now the street that goes down to Parking A, down there by the Student Center and the Engineering Building. That was where the preschool was. It faced Laurel Street. And most of the children remember it real well, big there. And we always had one or two disabled children. One little boy had cystic fibrosis and had a real time. He required a lot of help with anything we did, even riding a tricycle. He had to have help. And um, another little girl was totally blind, born totally blind, and she was angry when she'd come in in the mornings and she'd go over to the piano and just pound on it. And that seemed to work that out of her system. And But she could tell where I was at all times because of my voice, I'm sure. And she could go around children and head over toward me and she had a feel for everything. Um, she could ride a tricycle real well on a sidewalk, but not very well on the grass. But really interesting, and they were there partly because it did them a lot of good in learning to be there, but mostly so that the stu uh, students in child development could be acquainted with disabled children. It was mainly for their purpose that we had them in there. We only had 22 children, ages two and a half to five. Long, long waiting list. And we had to pick so many boys and so many girls, and some at two and a half, some at three, some at four. So some children who had registered never got in. And those that got in, it was supposed to be a big deal around town to get to the CSU preschool. And I thought it was too. I enjoyed teaching both the little children and the students. Was, that was my passion, was to teach. And um, my philosophy was, I hope they enjoyed the learning and I learned as much from them as they learned from me, every one of them. And we had a lot of opportunities during the hours, nine to one at the preschool, where you could stand and visit with a lot of the students that were in there. And they all had a history and they were all there for a reason. They were only juniors and seniors. They were all there for a good reason. And I still see some of them and last year at homecoming, um, a couple of students whom I hadn't seen in 50 years came up to me and said, do you remember me? And I said, you'll have to help me a little bit. But when they gave me their first names, I remembered having them in class. And um, so I think they enjoyed it too and learned. And a lot of them said it helped them when they had their fa families of their own. I thought some of the committees I was on, you were only on like two a semester or a quarter, but I thought some of the committees I, on were, I was on were ridiculous. And I thought some of them were kind of a waste of time. So I went to the dean and I was supposed to turn in a report after each committee meeting, which wasn't every week, but it was often enough to her, and it was hard to write those reports because we didn't accomplish anything. But I, so I went to the dean and I asked her if she could assign me more classes to teach and take me off of committees. And she turned me down, she wouldn't allow that. But one committee I was on, I thought was very important and there was a representative from each um, school, we were schools, not colleges then, 
from each school on the campus, like engineering and ag and forestry and all the different schools. And we were on a committee to figure out how to get on, or not online, but classes to outlying districts in Colorado, like Lamar, Colorado, or Sterling, or something that they couldn't get here for classes all the time. So it was really um, interesting, and as I call it a baby step toward the online courses now that are offered nationwide and internationally. It was a very, very interesting class, and it was the beginning of the online courses. That I liked. We accomplished something. Oh, well, I had a lot of advisees, and they weren't all uh, child development majors. They were in the Department of Home Economics. But they were very interesting. Some of them knew what they wanted to do. Some didn't have a clue. And I would tell them if they transferred in or out of the department that that was okay. Let's find something you want that will benefit you the rest of your life. And I don't care if you change majors as long as you can find one that fits you, that you like, and you're going to learn, and you're going to do something with it when you graduate. And most of them did. I had a little girl from a teeny town out near Burlington. First person in her family to come to college. And she was scared beyond words. She was homesick and just didn't know what to do with all these students. And so she came in to see me fairly often, and she literally was sick from being homesick. And um, I'd have her over to my home for dinner or something, and she was so thrilled to be in a home. And I didn't think she'd come back. We were on quarters then. I didn't think she'd be back the second quarter, but she came back and in the third quarter, and she came back her sophomore year. And each time I would see her, she was a little more steady, happier, um, knew what she wanted. And she did graduate. And the whole family came, this whole clan of people came. And I was invited to the graduation and a dinner afterwards because she was the first in her family to graduate from college. And they were all just so excited and so thrilled for her. And that's what my philosophy or my goal would be, would be to have them graduate, do something with it, even if it were with children, their own children, and gain a confidence for the rest of their lives. Early childhood education is important everywhere. So because of the social connections that the children have with each other and what they can learn from each other, the teachers aren't there to teach them everything. It's what they can learn from each other and um, gives them a good start when they begin formal, their formal education in kindergarten or first grade. I, I think that's, I think it's true that if they're, uh, a healthy child and go to preschool and enjoy it and learn and communicate and that they become healthy adults and in turn then their children are probably healthy and happy, happy children, happy's the word. And fun, fun, they were all fun. When I came to a Colorado A&M there were about 5,000 students here. And there were two dormitories. One was Braden Hall and one was Rockwell Hall. And all the freshman girls had to live in Rockwell Hall. So we all knew one another. And I don't know how it held us all, but 
apparently there were just that many of us. No cars were allowed. Um, very strict college hours. You had to be in at nine o'clock when you were a freshman. And I presume that so we would study <laughs> and pass a class. But um, if you didn't get in by nine o'clock or got so many demerits, then the consequences were pretty strict. When I graduated from a and in 1955, there were about 12,000 students here. And a lot of them were GIs that had come back from the war and were getting their uh, education on the GI Bill. And they lived in Wet Village. They lived in Vet Village. And um, these were Quonset huts on a concrete pad. And they were, there were many of them. They were west of Rockwell and the faculty apartments. No longer there, of course. But they were a metal, I think tin, but I'm not sure what they were, tin building that were a half circle sitting on this concrete pad. And they were cold in the winter and hot in the summer. And some of them even had weeds growing up between the, where the, the Quonset met the concrete. It was really pathetic, but they got through and had a nice education because they were on the GI Bill, a less expensive education. Oh, I loved Ammons Hall, which is still there. It had a swimming pool in it, which they've covered over. But it is a beautiful building, gorgeous building. The um, veterinary medicine uh, school was really interesting. If you go over there, they let you wander around a little bit or take you around. It was real fascinating. The um, infirmary was in a building that I didn't visit very often, but it was in the basement of a building that isn't even there anymore. It was next door to Guggenheim. And Guggenheim was really, is really a beautiful building with the wood floors and that beautiful staircase. And it's a lovely old, old building. Sure. Oh yes, yes, that was, it was in John, Johnson Hall was the student center, and they had a small bookstore in there, but they sold a lot of a and m logos and equipment and things and they served fresh cinnamon rolls every single morning, great big, huge things that we all ate every morning if we had a break in our classes and um the upstairs was where the uh, the um Annual was printed, the Silver Spruce, and I was, at, when I was a freshman, I was on the staff, and then by the time I was a senior, I was assistant editor of the Silver Spruce. And I don't know if they put out a Silver Spruce anymore or not, but boy, it was really something. It had all the, the um, students in there, all the different things you did, like the a cappella choir and all the clubs, and it had all the pacemakers in there, and then some of the student leaders of each class that were outstanding, and Johnson Hall was a favorite, and I don't know if it's still called that or not either, but it was a beautiful building. Yeah, I had a mentor whom I will always be grateful to, a doctor, uh, doctor, I knew his wife too, but he was in chemistry. And I was in this huge chemistry class of about 150 students. That was big to me. 
when you come from a graduating high school class of 111 students. And I was having a time with it. It was straight lecture and I didn't understand much about it. So I went in to Dr. Pulitzer, Puliston, Dr. Puliston. And he said, you come over this evening and I'll help you out. And I went there an hour till he made it as clear as the nose on my face. And I will be forever, and I still see him occasionally. He's a very elderly man now. And he remembers me and uh, I just love him. Um, I always admired Dee Gifford. She was quiet in a way but uh, ruled the Department of Home Economics kindly and was always there if you needed her for help or for any suggestions. She was really a leader, and I'm sure that's why they named Gifford Hall after her Gifford building. Um, I had a food science teacher Mrs. Charman, who was charming and was the epitome of neatness and she was strict in class, but she was good and I learned a lot from her. And it didn't matter what department they were in, I had a Dr. Durham who taught biology and microbiology and I just adored him. He made it very, very interesting and he was a good one. I adored the students and my advisees. Um, I had some really sharp people in there. One girl made a four point every quarter she was here. Well, then finally A&M became CSU, and we were no longer a department. We became a school of home economics, and um, a college of home economics, and the other who had been departments became schools, and then schools became colleges, and then it was on the semester system, so I taught on both. and. I think I liked the semester system better than the quarter system. It didn't wheel by quite so quickly and you could get more in depth in whatever subject you were teaching. My second passion was teaching um, students that I had in upper level classes of course at CSU and then I taught um, at UNC, I taught health physical education and recreation, they call it hyper majors, and I taught nursing school majors, and uh, I taught nutrition to them because in the meantime I received, I worked on and earned a master's degree in elementary education, and eventually I had to have a master's degree in food science and nutrition. So I taught classes over there. I also taught classes down at Alamosa at Adams State College. And I taught summer school classes at the University of Wyoming to mainly home ec teachers who needed extra credit to keep their certificates active. And they were really fun and I taught them all these different ways that you could teach nutrition and make it interesting to people and not dull. And I taught at, um, oh, I had a class, a night class for preschool teachers, mainly in Fort Collins. There might have been one from Wellington or somewhere else, but mainly Estes Park, as I recall, for um, preschool owners and they, I had to teach them the new rules, state rules and regulations that they had to meet in order to be licensed. 
And here are these women, some of them did not even have a high school education, but it was a way for them to earn a living and stay at home and be at home with families. One of them had a sick husband and we had fun in those classes, but those poor women worked all day long and then came to a night class from seven to 10, one night a week. I really admired them. After being in, at CSU for 18 years, I was offered a different position with private industry. And the reason I was offered that opportunity was because of my education at CSU and because I had a couple of master's degrees. And it was, I was hired as a nutrition educator with Dairy Council, Inc. And I covered the southern half of Colorado and the northern part of Wyoming. Traveled a lot, met the nicest people. They might, be, might have been an extension. They were home act teachers. They were hygienists. I gave programs to dental associations, to medical associations. Uh, a lot of programs were given and uh, in hopes that they could then learn more about nutrition. At the time, the nurses knew more nutrition than the doctors did, but the doctors were always anxious to learn. And um, sometimes I would go to hospital staffs if they would ask me and do that. Then I was loaned to the National Dairy Council in Chicago for two years to help establish and develop a nutrition program aimed at elementary and junior high school levels. And these could be in science classes or in physical education classes or wherever they chose to put it in. But we developed this marvelous program, which is still being used today. And I traveled all over the United States talking to school districts and schools, perhaps, or home ec associations or home economists in business or whatever, showing them these beautiful, beautiful materials that National Dairy Council developed. and. Um, and I, held, I was on the committee to help do that. It was a real thrill. And we came up with fantastic materials, which are still being used today. The reason I'm still involved somewhat at Colorado State is because of the people that are over there, the people in extension, the people in nutrition, in the College of Health and Human Services. Um, nicest people. They always appreciate me for some reason. Um, I've been on various and sundry committees, which I've enjoyed now <laughs> more than I did when I was teaching. But I've had the personal interactions with different ones at CSU, a lot of them in development. And um, They've all just been terrific to me, and I like to give to CSU, and I like to receive from CSU, which I have had the opportunity to do over the many years. But um, I've always valued and loved my experiences and my education that I received at A&M and CSU. It, it, it has proven to be a wealthy f faction in my life. And I'm always uh, bragging about A&M, or Colorado State now, and I have encouraged them to send their children here to school because they have so many opportunities here and you can major in journalism or all these business, school of business, or college of business is a wonderful college. And 
veterinary medicine, one of the best in the United States, and they would have all these opportunities, no matter what their likes, to major in here at CSU. And I think that's a wonderful thing to brag on. My education afforded me many, many opportunities in my life, all good. I had good jobs because of my good education from CSU. It's very interesting to me, and I love seeing the children of the children that I had in preschool, and most of them are grown now and perhaps have children of their own, but it is a ripple effect, and they're happy people, and they're, the ones I see are no problems and happy families and stable. And I think preschool deserves some credit for part of that. We had good parents, wonderful parents, and, uh, but I think their early childhood learning had a very positive effect on them for the rest of their lives.